Hey, welcome everybody. Recently, I had the opportunity to visit a beautiful garden in Connecticut. Everything was thriving in this garden. There were flowers and herbs and vegetables. The peach trees were so healthy. Everything looked great, except for just one tree, and it's a very old apple tree. So I looked at the apple tree and I saw maybe some possible symptoms of disease, but it didn't really look like anything I was able to identify right away. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if I could look at tree leaves and know exactly what's going on, especially if there is a nutritional deficiency? Well, the truth is there are some nutritional deficiencies that you can see when you're looking at tree leaves. And that is what we are going to talk about on the show today. So in this pre-recorded special episode, you'll be able to listen to the show if you're listening on Reality Radio 101, or you can head on over to the Orchard People YouTube channel, and you're going to get to see lots of visuals of all the diseases, or not diseases, of all the nutritional deficiencies that we are discussing in the show to get today. My guest today is Eric Hansen, and he is Professor Emeritus of Horticulture at Michigan State University. So Eric, tell me a little bit about your job. What is it that you did in terms of identifying nutritional deficiencies in fruit trees? Yeah, most of my job uh, was working for the Extension Service. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time um, helping Extension educators uh, to identify uh, problems. We, we did some research trials on uh, various nutritional problems that growers had encountered in orchards and elsewhere in, uh, uh, in Michigan. And then I taught a couple of uh, classes, one on uh, mineral nutrition of plants in general. So I've had been working in nutrition for quite a few years at different levels. Now, when you're working with commercial growers, I'm assuming a lot of the work that you do is by testing the soil. Isn't, is that the main way you find out what nutritional deficiencies there are in the, in the trees? Yeah, soil uh, testing is valuable, uh, but it has limitations in, in orchards and other perennial crops. So it's important to uh, test the soil to know what your pH is, uh, to know what the general nutrient levels are in the soil. And a soil test will do that uh, uh, for you, but it doesn't tell you everything. So one of the limitations, for example, is we don't have a good reliable uh, soil test for available nitrogen. Well, nitrogen management is a real key component of uh, a, effective uh, fertilization program for, for orchards. So that's that's a limitation. And then a, a bigger general limitation, I think, is that when we um, collect tissues uh, from the tree and we uh, compare those to soil nutrient levels, they often don't correlate very well. So you might find an orchard with uh, excessive levels of potassium in the, in the tree, but very low potassium levels in the uh, uh, soil test. So it's it's I guess my my guidance would be don't uh, uh, don't put too much credence in into what the soil test is uh, telling you. It's a a general measure of uh, nutrient levels. I think the most important thing is it, it tells you where your pH stands. When I'm working with students, I do want them to take a soil test, one, right in the beginning, just to see where their soil stands, what the, what is in the soil. But I love what you said, how you can have nutrients in the soil that don't get into the tree, or you can have nutrients in the tree that aren't in the soil. So what would cause those that mismatch? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the primary... Um, uh, cause to me is uh, when you're trying to monitor the nutrition of a, a big nutri big uh, perennial plant like an apple tree uh, that's been there for for a decade or two or three. Uh, it has a root system that's uh, very extensive. Uh, we sample the soil uh, 
in the top, uh, you know, eight inches or so of soil. Uh, it might be that the soil uh, below that is uh, has an abundant level of uh, potassium or other, or other elements. So your soil test might come back saying, oh, you're deficient, but the tree is still extracting enough of that nutrient uh, from depths that you can't sample from. Amazing. So that would explain why the tree might have lots of a nutrient that you can't find in the soil. But what if you have lots of nutrients in the soil that somehow doesn't get into the tree? What could be the problem there? Yeah, I, th I think sometimes it it, it uh, falls back on the same issue that uh, you're trying to sample the soil where most of the roots are feeding from. So during dry conditions on, on a particular summer, for example, uh, you might find that the, the uh, feeder roots in the top uh, six or eight inches where you're sampling are not very uh, uh, functional, that uh, the trees deriving its uh, water and nutrients from depths below that. Uh, so that might be an explanation for the, you know, poor correlation between what gets in the tree versus what you measure in the soil. Okay, so here we are, we've got this soil test with its limitations. And you are working, for instance, with commercial growers, and you need to help them. Is the next step then to take a, a tissue test? That's a plant tissue test. And what would that look like? Yeah, I think that's the most reliable indicator of the nutrient status of a perennial um, plants like an apple tree. Uh, and the standard procedure there is to uh, take leaves, leaves only, uh, and uh, typically from the middle of the current season's uh, shoot. So the trees are growing a shoot uh, each year, and you would take a mature uh, leaf from the middle of the shoot, and that would typically be taken in, in July here in, in Michigan or just generally in the middle of the growing season. Uh, you would want to sample uh, 50 to 100 leaves. And if you only have 10 trees, then you you might sample 5 to 10 uh, leaves per tree. If you have a, a five-acre orchard, you want to take leaves from uh, as many different uh, trees in, in the orchard so that your composite sample of leaves is uh, representative of the whole orchard. And then you can send those in to uh, reputable uh, labs. If you don't know of uh, a lab to use, you might contact your extension uh, educators in your area. They usually know uh, where to go with that sample. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So with the commercial growers, you would do a plant tissue test. Now, I, I'm assuming they are available for home growers uh, they may be a little expensive, I'm guessing. Uh, do you know much about that? Yeah, I haven't uh, looked at prices recently, but you're right that they are expensive. So, And that's why a lot of growers, even uh, commercial growers, um, probably don't use that uh, service as much as they should, in my, my opinion. But it might be um, $25 to $35 to have uh, all the nutrients analyzed in one leaf sample. So that's that's kind of a turnoff for some people, certainly would be for some uh, backyard orchardists who, who really are just interested in growing their two trees. Uh, but um, I think it provides the best, most accurate, reliable information about the nutrient status of the plant. Fabulous. Okay, so for commercial growers, even for home growers, that is an option. And then there are your eyes and observ observation and looking at the leaves. To what extent is that a useful tool um, when it comes to uh, diagnosing or deciding whether a fruit tree has a nutritional deficiency? Yeah, it's it's uh, partly science and partly art to me. Um, it takes a lot of um, years of experience looking at different problems and in orchards and some um, commercial growers that have been at it for a long time are excellent experts at uh, diagnosing what they, they see in the in the field. But it, the problem with it is there are a lot of um, other maladies in 
fruit trees that look similar to the symptoms that you'd see as a result of uh, nutrient deficiencies. So mm -hmm. it's it's fairly easy to misdiagnose uh, problems based on what you simply what you see on, in the leaves on on a tree. It's not to say that it's not important to understand, and there are some great online resources for um, with um, collections of uh, images of different nutrient deficiency symptoms on on trees. So you you can it can be helpful. Okay, well, I think we should dive right in because let's discuss it nutrient by nutrient. And for those people who are watching this on uh, YouTube, you will be able to see some of the pictures. If you're listening to an audio version of the show, um, we will describe what we're looking at. So let's have mm -hmm. a look here. Okay, so let's start mm -hmm. with nitrogen deficiency. Um Nitrogen is important for fruit trees because why is this such an important nutrient for fruit trees? In orchards, the single most commonly uh, limiting nutrient is, is nitrogen. Uh, so managing nitrogen levels is, uh, is really critical uh, to, because it's quite often deficient. It's also the case that if you're over fertilizing uh, fruit trees that you can cause issues too. So if you over fertilize apple trees, for example, you'll uh, create a excessive vegetative growth uh, that makes uh, pruning a, a longer job. It uh, also reduces potentially the quality of the fruit that you get from the, from the tree. So managing uh, trees with the right amount of nitrogen is pretty important. <clears throat> well, from my personal experience, so we planted our fruit trees in a community orchard in our local park where the soil is, was and is not very good. And I remember looking at those trees and thinking they were fine, uh, where the park supervisor at the time, who loved growing fruit trees, he looked at our trees and he said, oh boy, those trees need more nitrogen because he saw the time it was in the summer, we had planted these trees and there was hardly any growth. You couldn't see any new growth. They looked like the exact same tree that he had picked up from the nursery or from the garden center and we planted. So um, for me to understand nitrogen deficiency was to understand that if you don't have a lot of new growth on your tree, you possibly have nitrogen deficiency. In fact, it's pretty likely. Is that correct? Yeah, it's certainly one measure of uh, nitrogen status. Are the trees growing well? And that being said, you know, if, if you're going through a drought uh, situation or um, uh, that they could be growing poorly on a given year because of water, water stress too, but lack of nitrogen reduces growth. And there, there was an old um, standard uh, rule of thumb when I first started working uh, that you know, for apples or pears, your goal might be to grow eight to 12 inch uh, shoots during a year. And for uh, stone fruit like, like peaches, it might be uh, one to two foot long uh, uh, shoots. So if you're not getting that, then it's potentially you're not getting enough nitrogen into the tree. Yeah. So for me and for us in our group, we would actually go out with measuring tape and we'd, you know, see what, whether it's at the end of the year to see if we had that one foot of growth or two feet. Um, so that's a great tool to kind of see, okay, am I getting enough growth or perhaps am I lacking in nitrogen? But you have also given me some pictures of what nitrogen deficiency can look like and how it might exhibit itself in the leaves. So describe to me what we're seeing here. Yeah, th these are just some pictures that I've uh, collected over over the years of apples and uh, uh, peaches uh, that are lacking nitrogen. And the thing to, uh, a couple of things to remember. First, the color of the leaves uh, is uh, washed out. So you tend to get a uh, a lighter green color instead of a healthy dark green color in the leaves. The leaf size might be reduced. We mentioned that the shoot growth is usually reduced. And then another really interesting aspect of nitrogen is that it's mobile in plants. So uh, 
uh, fruit trees can remobilize nitrogen from the old leaves and move it to the actively growing shoot tip uh, where it's most needed. So a characteristic of nitrogen, uh, lack of nitrogen symptoms is that the most severe symptoms, uh, the porous color are usually in the leaves towards the base of the shoot. And you can uh, see that on the uh, peach uh, picture uh, here. But what's happening is the tree is able to take the nitrogen out of the older leaves that are not as important to the tree and uh, move that to the uh, younger leaves towards the shoot tip. So if you see that kind of uh, pattern, that's another indication that the nitrogen levels are low. Oh my gosh, that is so touching. It's kind of like, you know, if a family, you know, is living in a country where there's not enough food and the parents hold back and they're like, okay, I'll, I'll go hungry. Let my children eat. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that so touching that the fruit tree will, will bring um, the nutrients to the, the little leaves growing at the tip because that's their future. I guess that that's, is that why those little leaves are so important? The younger leaves? Yeah, I, it's a pretty good analogy. Um, I I don't know the uh, how much uh, thought trees give to it, but uh, they, they, they uh, certainly Tree psychology. value the younger leaves over the the older uh, older mature leaves. Yeah. Well, I should be a tree psychologist then. <laughs> okay, so so we are looking for with nitrogen deficiency, the leaves may not be very dark green. Um, they also may be lighter in the older part of the branch uh, and moving the darker green to the end. So uh, that is a sign. Those are perhaps signs of nitrogen deficiency. Let's move on and let's talk about another important nutrient here. Let's talk about potassium deficiency and what that might look like in the leaves of a fruit tree. Um, tell us what role potassium plays in it. Why is potassium important with uh, fruit tree growth and production? It, it has a number of different functions in trees on a physiological uh, level, but a lot of it is related to water management in, in the trees. So when, one function, for example, is to allow the trees to open and close these microscopic uh, pores on, on the uh, uh, trees to regulate uh, water uh, water loss, but a number of other functions is, as well. The, and quite often that brings up an important point is quite often, you know, in science, we, we talk about the function of nutrients in plants, but the symptoms that you see in trees or, or any plants that are deficient uh, very often don't relate to what the nutrient does physiologically in, in the uh, tissues. Um, but in, in the case of potassium, the, the classic symptoms of uh, deficiency are um, leaf curling and uh, burning or necrosis along the margins of the leaves. So um, a couple of those pictures uh, show in uh, tart cherries on the upper left. Um, the curling that can occur, and, and you might expect maybe that looks like uh, uh, water stress, and it's very similar to water stress, but uh, that's caused by inadequate uh, potassium. And then the uh, burning along the margins of the leaves on the uh, lower right um, is the other classic symptom of potassium uh, deficiency. Well, that's very helpful because, you know, burning along the margins. So if we're looking at the leaf, we can see sort of death or like of the tissue or just like sort of brownish color around the the sort of the outside of the leaf. The leaf margins is the outside of the leaf. That's a really cool thing to recognize and be able to recognize um, to show you about potassium deficiency. Something you've mentioned a couple of times is the role of water, why drought makes our problems worse. And one thing that I've said to people, it's like, you know, fruit trees, they don't have teeth. So they can't chew their nutrients, which means that they have to only bring in nutrients in liquid form. So if a tree is dehydrated and can't access 
water in the soil, because there is none, then it's also starving and it's going to have nutritional deficiencies. So does that relate here with potassium or even nitrogen? Yeah, I think it can relate to any of the uptake of any of the nutrients that you're absolutely right that they're all absorbed and in solution. Uh, so the tree is pulling water uh, into the roots. And as it does that, it's supplying uh, what uh, dissolved uh, elements are in the water to the tree. So if uh, the tree is shutting down because of water stress, uh, the supply of nutrients also is diminished. Got it. Okay, so let's continue on at, to see our next nutrient, and that's magnesium. All right, so why is magnesium important for our fruit trees, our apple trees, cherries, apricots, peaches? What does magnesium do? Well, again, multiple functions, but um, uh, one of them is uh, a component of uh, the chlorophyll molecule. Uh, so that's um, just one of the physiological uh, functions. Um, it's magnesium is quite often uh, deficient in orchards in, in Michigan, and I think in a lot of areas of the uh, Midwest, uh, U.S., and, and uh, Canada. Uh, it's not as commonly deficient as nitrogen, for example, and certainly uh, uh, potassium, but we do see uh, deficiencies of it. And it's it's kind of a, a more difficult one to diagnose. So um, you can see in one of these uh, pictures, uh, uh, chlorosis and, and eventually necrosis, the, the uh, burning of the tissues along the margins of the leaves. And the difference between that and potassium deficiency is the burning along the margins uh, due to potassium deficiency tends to be fairly uniform. So it's a band around the outside of the leaf. And in this one uh, picture on the upper right, you can see that the um, necrosis or the burning uh, extends in between the main veins of the leaf. So it, it results in a kind of a Christmas tree shaped uh, center of the leaf that, that retains the green uh, uh, color uh, with the burning along the margin. So it's a little different than potassium deficiency. And then potassium, mm -hmm. I had uh, neglected to mention, is also a very mobile element in, in plants. So that, like nitrogen, uh, you're likely to see the symptoms develop first on the older leaves on a, on a shoot and then progress up to the uh, younger leaves. In the case of magnesium, it tends to be fairly mobile as well. So you usually see the more severe symptoms further down on the shoots on the older leaves. And uh, it's not to say that it can affect uh, younger leaves as well. Uh, but that's just a, another diagnostic uh, characteristic of magnesium deficiency. Oh, it's so exciting because these are all wonderful concrete hints. So, you know, if we're looking to see necrosis, which is sort of the death or the burning look uh, of the leaves. So uh, with magnesium, it's not just around the edges of the leaf. It starts to move in towards that central line of the leaf and uh, between the the veins of the leaf. So that's great. And also we'd be looking at older leaves. Uh, right. They might be more likely to get it. Wonderful. Let's do one more and then we'll just have a little respite for our commercial break. But let's just talk about manganese next. Tell me a little bit about manganese. That's not one that you, you know, people really think as much about. Usually you go to get your NPK fertilizers, you know, with just the, the big, big nutrients. So why is manganese important for fruit trees? Yeah, we've talked to this point about the, uh, what we call the macronutrients. So nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, magnesium. Uh, so manganese is uh, uh, referred to as a micronutrient. So it's not that it's less important to the plant. The plant can't survive without it. But uh, the quantities that are needed by the tree are much, much lower. So that's why it's called a micronutrient. 
And uh, manganese is, is an interesting one and also often confused with uh, deficiencies of other uh, elements. Um, uh, iron deficiency will cause similar symptoms. You can see uh, from these pictures that the uh, leaves retain a green uh, main vein and, and major veins in the leaves while the rest of the leaf is turning uh, uh, chlorotic. So it kind of it's similar in some respects to magnesium deficiency too. Uh, the difference is, uh, or one difference to look at is that manganese is not very mobile in plants. So if you look at the shoot on the lower left, uh, those uh, leaves are affected right out to the tip. So the oldest leaves are affected as well as the youngest leaves. So that's a clue uh, that you're probably dealing with a uh, nutrient that's not very mobile in the plant. We're turning into private detectives here, detectives of nutrient deficiencies. Okay, so manganese, it's you can see that it's different. I'm not seeing a lot of dead tissue, you know, like we've seen in the previous ones. So the leaves uh, are green, but they're different colors of green. The the chlorosis makes the part of the green look quite yellow. So you know, like you say, you've got our we've got our veins that are still dark green down the middle of the leaf, and then the sort of secondary veins at the side are side are still dark green, but the rest of the leaf is looking sort of a lighter green, and uh, not too healthy. So yeah. that's manganese. Yeah, that's a great great description. I wanted to mention a couple other things about manganese that are uh, interesting too. Is if you're using herbicides, uh, uh, pre-emergent herbicides are applied to the soil. Uh, some of those, if you're applying too much and they're stressing the tree, will develop symptoms that are real similar to to this too. So you'll see this uh, intervenal uh, chlorosis. Uh, that's often hard to, to separate from a nutrient deficiency. And then the, the last thing I wanted to say about manganese is there's a picture of um, kind of scaly looking apple bark on a, on a branch. And that's a, a picture of internal bark necrosis. And uh, it's caused uh, by manganese, but not inadequate levels. It's caused by uh, excessive levels. So it seems for some reason to concentrate in the uh, cambium tissue just under the uh, bark and cause damage there if the tree is getting too much uh, manganese. So this is the first time we talked about uh, toxicity uh, due to uh, a nutrient in addition to deficiency symptoms. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, what you know, there there is this tendency of over nurturing your tree. Well, just in case it has a deficiency, let me throw some fertilizer at it. Let me get some. Oh, I hate them. The the fertilizer fruit tree fertilizer spikes that yeah. people get online and it's giving your tree nutrients that it may not need. And you get so many bad reactions. So it is such a delicate thing. Um, where you want to get just the right amount of these nutrients and not too much. Um, that's why it's so important to do your homework and to feed your trees really carefully, I would think. Do you agree? Yeah, more is not always better. And um, it, it's also uh, true that um, try to understand the most common nutrient problems that you're, uh, that other people have experienced in your area. It, it varies from region to region uh, somewhat, but if you understand that um, uh, three quarters of the problems uh, nutrient related in orchards in your area are due to nitrogen uh, and or potassium, then it gives you a, a feel for whether you should even be concerned about deficiencies of some of these other elements. So Eric, I want to go into more detail about some more nutritional deficiencies and what we would see on the leaves of our trees. But I would like to first hear a few words from our sponsors. Are you okay holding on the line for a couple of minutes? Yeah, that's wonderful, sure. Thank you so much. You are listening to a special pre-recorded episode of Orchard People, a radio show and podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care training website, orchardpeople.com.
This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm Susan Poisner, author of three fruit tree care books, Growing Urban Orchards, Grow Fruit Trees Fast, and Fruit Tree Crafting for Everyone. And we'll be back right after this break. Do you want to learn how to grow organic fruit trees quickly and successfully? I'm Susan Poisner from OrchardPeople.com, and I teach online courses. Here's some feedback from one of my happy students. My name is Jennifer Chandler, and I started growing fruit trees three years ago now. I would recommend Orchard People courses primarily because it is an excellent way to get up to speed fairly quickly and to build your confidence. There seem to be so many different theories of what to do and different recipes for this and that. One isn't overwhelmed by the advice in Orchard People. I just find it so much faster to get up to speed and build confidence than trying to piece it together surfing the web or at the library. Check out my courses at learn.orchardpeople.com. If you're listening to this show, you are passionate about fruit trees. But do you care how your trees are grown? Silver Creek Nursery is a family-owned business, and we grow our fruit trees sustainably using only organic inputs. We stock a huge range of cultivars, like Wolf River, an apple tree that produces fruit so large you can make an entire pie with just one apple. We also carry red-fleshed apples, like Pink Pearl, as well as heirloom and disease-resistant varieties of apples, pears, apricots, cherries, and more. We ship our trees across Canada, and we can also supply you with berry canes and edible companion plants to plant near your trees. At Silver Creek Nursery, we grow fruit trees for a sustainable food future. Learn more about us at silvercreeknursery.ca. If you're thinking of planting fruit trees and you're looking for a wide selection of cultivars, consider Wiffle Tree Nursery. Our 62-page full-color catalog includes over 300 varieties of fruit and nut trees, berries, grapes, and other edible perennial plants. Not only that, in our catalog we help you through the selection process with tips and advice about all aspects of growing fruit trees. You can learn about adding nitrogen-fixing plants, rootstock choices, and even about planting a windbreak if you have a windy site. We're a one-stop shop as we sell fruit tree care books, pruning tools, organic sprays, and natural fertilizers. We're located in Alora, Ontario, but we can ship all over Canada. Call us at 519-669-1349 to order your catalog. That's 519-669-1349. Wiffle Tree Nursery. Call us today. You are listening to Orchard People, a radio show and podcast brought to you by the fruit tree care training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm your host, Susan Poisner. In the show today, we've been talking to Eric Hansen. He is Professor Emeritus of Horticulture from Michigan State University, and we have been talking about nutritional deficiencies in fruit trees and how to recognize them. So in the first part of the show, we talked about nitrogen, we talked about manganese, we talked about some other nutrients. Okay, so we're looking at some pictures here of boron deficiency. Uh, Tell me a little bit of what boron is and how important that is for fruit trees. Yeah, uh, again, it's another micronutrient. So the trees don't need much of it, but they won't survive uh, without it. And it's a peculiar thing because it, it was over a hundred years ago that scientists um, um, learned that uh, plants have a boron requirement. It's an essential element, but it took until about 15 years ago before an actual function of boron was recognized. So we, we now know that it's uh, 
forms kind of a cement holding together parts of cell walls in uh, that surround each uh, cell in, in plants. But it was pretty fascinating that uh, people understood that plants need it, but it was so long before scientists could figure out what the purpose was for it in plants. What, what it did. So is boron important in all the tissue, like in the branches and the leaves and in the fruit, or is there a certain part of the tree that it plays a more important role? Yeah, every, um, every tissue, every cell type in plants uh, have a boron uh, requirement. Um, wow. It's a matter of uh, what you see in a deficient plant um, has more to do um, with the um, mobility of boron in, in plants. So this is one that, uh, except for uh, some uh, species, is uh, fairly immobile in, in plants. So it, the, there's a picture uh, shown of a, a shoot that's an old picture. It, it was uh, taken in the Hood River Valley of uh, Oregon years and years ago, but um, it's called uh, a dieback of uh, shoot tips. So the shoots will grow uh, seemingly normally early in the season, and then they'll get to a point where they simply run out of boron and the tip of the shoot will die back. So Ooh. shoot, shoot uh, t uh, tip dieback. And is that just in apple trees or will that be in peaches and cherries and everything and all the other trees? Uh, it can occur in, uh, in all trees. It, it, part, of the, um, part of the reason that this occurs is that uh, uh, trees have difficulty moving boron from the older tissues to supply the actively growing uh, uh, shoot tips. Uh, some species uh, have uh, provide more mobility of boron uh, in the tissues than than others. That's so interesting. So you've been talking about mobility. I love this idea that a fruit tree takes in nutrients and some of the nutrients are happy moving around. They'll go everywhere. They just ride the the sort of water slide inside the plant. They can sort of almost be drawn up into different branches. They can move to the old leaves and the new leaves. And some nutrients are just like, no, I'm staying where I am. I am not mobile. I'm not going anywhere. And yet you're saying that in this case of boron, it's not the nutrients that's mobile, but it's like the cultivar. In some cultivars, it can move around and in some it can't. Well, it's more more species related, and it, ah. it has to do. Uh, some species uh, transport um, uh, sugars, and some species transport sugar alcohols. This is probably more detailed than anybody cares to know, but um, the boron actually um, uh, attaches to sugar alcohols, and so it can move in those species that use those as carbon transport molecules. So give me an example of a species where boron is moving around, no problem. Um, a sour cherry, for example. And um, sour cherry, uh, we, we did some work uh, years ago where we used a uh, labeled form of boron and we'd apply it to, to leaves. And, Within a few hours, you could document the movement of that boron out of the leaves. And what, what that means is boron is transported, uh, it's called primary transport. So it's transported with the water that the leaves are transpiring or losing to the atmosphere. And that deposits the uh, boron in, in the leaves. But then there's another transport system that can move uh, boron out of that leaf and into other parts of the uh, tree. And in the case of cherries, it it's, uh, has a, a mechanism to, to do that. So sour cherries, boron moves around, no problem. Are there other species like, I don't know, apple or pear or apricot where boron is kind of a little notoriously slow? Yeah. the, the um, a good example would be uh, uh, nut trees, for example. They they are uh, don't have that uh, sugar transport mechanism, uh, or the the uh, sugar alcohol transport mechanism mechanism. So they they can't move boron, uh, 
And as a result, then you're likely to see the, the actively growing shoot tips to kind of grow themselves into a deficiency as, as the uh, season goes on. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So boron, you might see dieback of shoot tips. I see also that there's this issue of bark necrosis. So parts of the bark might die as a result of that boron deficiency. Yeah, and that's something I've never run into in uh, in the Midwest, but in the Pacific Northwest, I know that uh, that has occurred. So it kind of similar to um, bark necrosis caused by manganese toxicity, but it's caused by actually a, a lack of boron uh, in those tissues. Right. Interesting. Okay, let's go on to another nutrient. Whoops, I just went too quickly. Oh, hang on. So we were talking about yeah. boron deficiency in the shoots, but I see that boron deficiency may also affect the fruits. What would that look like? Yeah, boron has a lot of peculiar effects on in fruit trees. And one of them is disorders of the uh, fruit. So the fruit uh, can develop uh, corking. So there are some pictures of uh, apple fruit that are severely affected. Uh, they have uh, necrotic uh, areas in the middle of the flesh of the fruit. And you can tell that those are there just by looking at the outside of the fruit. And then also corking. So there are a couple of pictures of, of splitting and cracking in uh, pear fruit and cherry fruit. And this relates to uh, trans transport of boron in the plant probably, but also how actively or quickly growing those tissues are. So a, a young apple fruit is growing very, very fast. And it may be that it's just growing into a deficiency because the supply of boron can't keep up with the growth rate of that, that organ. Um, it, it, mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. I, I was going to say the other peculiar things is uh, uh, boron is very uh, uh, important in the fruit set process. So uh, pollination and uh, fertilization of, of flowers requires uh, boron. So there's a picture of um, grape um, uh, berries uh, that should be a beautiful large cluster, and it's just a, a small cluster with some little tiny uh, uh, berries that probably contain one seed, if, if no seeds. So pollination is an important uh, component. And then there's also a, a picture uh, on the upper right, and that's a sim symptom called blossom blasting. And it's, again, not seen in the uh, Midwest that I know of, but um, was common in the Pacific Northwest. And this is where the flowers develop uh, seemingly normal, uh, but they get to a certain stage and then they just turn, uh, turn brown and drop off. So they're, they blast. And wow. that was due to inadequate boron uptake in the fall. So what uh, people have found is that for a healthy flower, there has to be enough boron reserves in the uh, spur and in the young twig tissue to supply the development of the flower in the first thing in the spring. So with this boron deficiency, I'm getting, we got lumpy fruit, lumpy looking fruit. Now it's easy to confuse that with certain mm -hmm. pest issues as well or disease issues, but you got lumpy fruit, you cut the fruit open, for instance, the apples, it's browning inside. I've, I see here cherries that are deformed. I see fruit that's too small. So a little bit of boron is necessary and without it, you can have big problems. Yeah. So very interesting. Let's look now, we've got just a couple more to talk about. Um, I wanna talk about zinc. Um, why is zinc important and what will it look like if we have a zinc deficiency? Yeah, zinc is another micronutrient. Uh, one of the uh, functions is in the uh, pathway for development uh, or production of uh, auxin in, uh, in plants. And auxin's a, a growth regulator. And this is 
I think one of the few nutrients where the symptoms that develop have something to do uh, with the function of the nutrient in the plant on a physiological level. So one of the symptoms is, is uh, shown in the picture on the lower right is uh, uh, peach shoots that have a full complement of leaves, but they haven't extended. So there's a tuft of leaves at the tip of the shoot, and that's called a rosette. And it's fairly uh, uh, easy to uh, identify when, when you uh, see it. But oxen uh, causes elongation of, of shoots. It is an important regulator in, in that way. So you can kind of make the case, well, maybe here's a nutrient that's required for production of a hormone. And if that hormone's not produced, then you see a symptom of rosetting in the uh, in the young shoots. Wow. Yeah. So when you're looking at this, I'm looking at a bunch of um, branches, I guess, mostly from peach trees here. I can't really tell, but they look pretty sort of bald. <laughs> the yeah. leaves are too small. They They just look very sad. They're not yeah. extending properly. Can this, if this is in peach trees, does would you see this as well in apple trees? Yeah, I think these pictures, again, they're quite old, um, are in apple. And it, they show uh, a second symptom of zinc deficiency, which is um, little leaf and blind wood. So um, it's a peculiar situation where if the trees are uh, short of uh, zinc, the um, leaves that develop on last year's uh, wood, so that's lower down on the uh, branches, tend to develop poorly. So they might be very small. And in some cases, those buds may uh, not develop at all so that you have blind wood or leafless wood below the current season's uh, growth on the tip of the shoots. So you can almost imagine if once you get familiar with that, if you were driving down your orchard row, you'd, you'd probably be able to recognize that because it's standing out right on the uh, end of the uh, end of the shoots. Well, I've seen something like that before in our orchard. So we have mostly uh, trees that are disease resistant and because they're easier to grow. And I, I like encouraging people to grow those trees. But there's one tree that is not resistant and it's struggled over the years with a nasty fruit tree disease called fire blight. And right now it doesn't seem to have fire blight, but if you look up into the canopy where all the other trees, the apple trees are leafy and they filled in, we prune them carefully so there's nice open air circulation. But this poor little tree, the leaves are so small, there is definitely, you know, what do you call it? Um, blind wood? Uh, wood. You know, yeah. yeah, where there's no, not really, there's some parts of the branch that there's not really many leaves. It's trying so hard. So perhaps it could be a zinc issue. Maybe it's something else. This poor tree is struggling. I mean, one thing that comes to mind when we're talking about this is as people listen to this episode, they'll be like, oh, okay, I have to get a bag of boron for my tree and I have to get some zinc for my tree. And I think my perspective is as a person who is a small scale grower, and probably even, you know, commercial growers need to think about this too. You want to have a tree that is generally healthy rather than, you know, putting this ingredient and that ingredient, the more you can invest in the general health of your fruit tree and feeding it annually with, you know, compost or, you know, not in natural ways, then hopefully the balance will come on its own. Is that possible? Is that true? Yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great point. Um, in in a lot of cases, um, we can avoid uh, deficiency problems by providing a holistic uh, approach to orchard uh, nutrition. So uh, compost, for example, that are uh, produced from uh, plant material uh, contain all the essential elements that uh, the tree needs. It might not contain everything that the tree needs, but it's a great starting point is to build a healthy uh, functional soil to begin with, and you're much less likely to run into defici deficiencies of uh, particular elements. 
And Absolutely. Yeah. Our, our favorite thing in our orchard, we're not really allowed to have like a vegetable compost bin or whatever, but we do collect the leaves at the end of the year from all over the park. We pile them up. And as we weed in the spring, any weeds that don't have weed seeds that are invasive, we pop on that same pile. And the pile just disappears over time, you know, but that kind of thing is a living compost. There's going to be uh, like wonderful, healthy, friendly bacteria in there, you know, so for people to start to think, I also have at learn.orchardpeople.com, one of my courses is specifically on soil and how to improve your soil to have healthier fruit trees. So if people are interested, they can have a look at learn.orchardpeople.com and check out my soil course because there are so many natural ways to help our trees without getting bags of this and bags of that. And it's also healthier for the environment. So, yeah. okay, we have one more. Let's see. Let's talk about this. I think we've come up close to the end of the show, but I want to talk about iron deficiency. Because this is one uh, that I've seen a lot of examples of in various plants over the years. So tell me why iron is important. Yeah, so iron uh, regulates a number of different physiological processes in, in, in the plant. Uh, it's a very immobile element. And it's a great example of, of that and are these uh, pictures of deficiency. So you can see um, in each picture that the most severely chlorotic uh, leaves are on the very tips of the, uh, the, the shoots. So it's a case where the plant might want to maintain the health of those youngest uh, shoot tips, but there's no way to move man um, iron from the older tissue to maintain the health of the younger uh, shoots. Uh, when when you say chlorotic, is chlorotic essentially yellow? It means that the green tissue is not looking green, it's yellow. Is that what chlorosis is? Yeah, chlorosis is a uh, um, loss of the normal uh, uh, leaf color, whereas chlorosis is what people, uh, term people use to talk about dead tissue. So uh, it's gone past uh, chlorotic, it's uh, necrotic oh. or dead. Oh, chlorosis, chlorotic versus necrotic, Correct. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Necrosis with an N, that's dead tissue, but chlorosis is living tissue, not looking so good, turning yellow. And I can see in these pictures, you do have lots of photos showing that especially the young leaves are turning yellow in various trees. And you're saying that's because the iron is one of those stubborn nutrients that will not move around. So perhaps the older leaves are part of the branch that did have iron at that time. So yeah. they're, they, they, the green, they're green, they're fine. But somehow the iron is not going into the newer leaves. Um, That's a great way to describe it, yeah. But I'm just curious because if iron isn't a mobile nutrient it has to come into the tree through the roots anyways unless you're doing uh some sort of uh foliar spray on the leaves so it must somehow be able to get to the new growth yeah there's a certain supply that's happening all the time uh through the transpiration stream so the, all those leaves are uh, losing water, they're pulling it up through the roots, and iron is to some degree in, in that water. Early in the season, I think there's more water generally available uh, in a general sense. Uh, so there's more um, iron that's supplied to the younger leaves early in the season. Then when you get uh, into midsummer, it might be that the water supply is somewhat diminished uh, and the iron supply to the younger leaves is diminished as, as a result. So they, they uh, catch the problem uh, quicker as a result. Mm -hmm. And the other, I wanted to mention too, we talked about the importance of pH. So when I see symptoms of iron deficiency, it tells me just about immediately 
that the pH of that soil is too high. So a high pH soil um, uh, binds up iron, so there's less available for the plant to take up. So when you see iron deficiency symptoms, it usually indicates that the pH is way too high. So the bottom picture here was from a colleague uh, at MSU, uh, Frank Dennis, who uh, was visiting Mexico. And uh, they that's a arid uh, environment. And most arid environments uh, have soils that tend to be more uh, alkaline, high pH. And that's what's causing the, the iron deficiency in that uh, uh, small tree. Yeah, pH is very interesting because, um, you know, it, depending on the pH of your soil, you can have, from what I understand, you can have nutrients in the soil, but they can't get into the tree in certain pH. Is that, how does that work exactly? In, in most cases, it's, it's a simple chemical reaction. So at a certain pH, an element may be uh, soluble at a different pH, that element uh, precipitates out of solution. It becomes insoluble. So it's not no longer available to the plant roots. So that is so simple. Just, yeah, it's usually just a chemical uh, situation. And that brings us back to what we discussed earlier, this whole idea that fruit trees don't have teeth. They have to suck in the nutrients in a liquid form. And if the nutrient is not soluble, uh, in the pH of your soil, well then, tough luck fruit tree. Exactly. Is there any other thoughts or suggestions that you can share with us for home growers that really want to look after their trees, um, but without hopefully having to turn to, um, you know, bags of this and bottles of that in order to fertilize them? I, I guess my... my... Basic idea is is that uh, going back to uh, compost and uh, organic amendments and uh, materials that generally improve the health of the soil is a good uh, place to start. So if you're doing that, you're much less likely to run into um, specific nutrient problems. Um, it's not to say that you you may not and you may need to. Uh, provide some curative uh, treatment for a particular uh, element. But if you can uh, maintain a healthy amount of uh, organic matter in the soil, you might do that by composting every uh, few years. It, it, you might do it by providing uh, bark uh, mulch under the trees that over time is degrading and decomposing and releasing nutrients that are available to the tree. That's a kind of a holistic, I think, easier way to maintain uh, the tree in a good, healthy, uh, nutritional state. Uh, I, I think, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I was just going to say the other the other thing is pH. So we talked about the importance there, and that's something that um, you you need to be aware of. Um, you you can. Um, create pH problems uh, by applying some uh, compost, for example. So if you had a cheap source of um, uh, chicken compost from an egg laying uh, operation, that, that stuff is very high in calcium and very high in pH. So you could create an issue uh, with uh, the wrong kind of uh, compost too. Exactly. So yeah, so again, I'd love to plug my course, Soil Essentials for Fruit Trees at learn.orchardpeople.com. There is so much to learn and it is so fascinating. Soil is so interesting. My first passion was fruit trees and then I started to learn what's happening in the soil and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is a whole new world. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. But um, Eric, thank you so much. How can people uh, learn more about you? Have you written any books or are there any articles that we can see or a website you can share? Yeah, there, my website at uh, Michigan State University Department of Horticulture is uh, still up and uh, not too active since I've been retired for, for several uh, years here. But most of the early work is uh, still 
listed there that people are interested. Fantastic. And I would love to have you back again. Maybe next time we can talk about different amendments and how things work. Um, but it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I feel like it's empowering to go through and and just to start observing a little bit more, really paying attention to our fruit trees to so we can be better, you know, um, stewards of our trees just by paying attention to them, yeah. giving them the love that they need and deserve. <laughs> that's exactly so, yeah thank you so much now if anybody uh wants to listen to this show again or watch a video version of this show it is available folks you can go to orchardpeople.com and click on podcasts and you'll see this podcast you'll see all the other podcasts i've done and this is number i think 106 or 107 there's over 100 of them so far you can also go to the Orchard People YouTube channel, and I have a video podcast playlist with the video versions of my podcasts. So you can go there, you can see all the pictures of everything we've talked about today. And finally, if you want to know, this show is most of the time goes out live. And if you want advance notice of when the show is, be sure to sign up for my mailing list. All you have to do is go to orchardpeople.com slash sign up. And then I'm going to send you notices once a month about upcoming podcasts, about new articles on my website. So thanks everybody for tuning into this show. That's all for now, but I hope you will join me again next month and we will talk about another wonderful and interesting fruit tree care topic. I'll see you then. Bye for now.